please turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. This is the book that we are going through at present. 1 Peter, we're going to be in chapter 2. And this morning we're going back to school, we're going back to the classroom. We're going to have a lesson on a particular subject that I'm sure is very familiar to all of you. A subject that you know very well. But rather like mathematics, you might think that you know it very well until a test comes. And when tests come, it's when we really come to know whether or not we understand something. We're going to look this morning at the subject of suffering. Uh, suffering. As we come to chapter 2 in the particular passage we're looking at this morning, from here onwards, suffering is mentioned specifically by name nearly three times more than any other book in the Bible. The word suffering, 16 times. It's a lot, isn't it? And so this morning we're going to learn about suffering. We have the best teacher we could possibly have, a glorious teacher, the Lord Jesus himself, who actually gives us an example of how we should deal with suffering when it comes into our lives. As we've gone through 1 Peter so far, we've seen that this letter is addressed to those who are elect, to those who, according to God's great mercy, have been born again to a living hope. Believers, we read, who have been ransomed out of this world, through the precious blood of Christ. Those who have been chosen, those who have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who have been chosen and called so that we might proclaim his excellencies. And so that we might live lives that are honorable Lives that are marked by goodness such that we commend the gospel. So from here on we are looking at what it, what it looks like to live a godly life. If we're going to live an honourable life, what does it look like in practice? And last week we saw how it means living in submission. Living under... God-given authority. Recognizing that God is the one who is Lord over all. He is sovereign, but he appoints those who have authority in various spheres. And as is appropriate, we need to submit ourselves for his sake to those in authority over us. Well, you might be thinking... What has that got to do with suffering? Why are we now going to read about suffering? And the point is that as we humbly seek to submit ourselves to those whom God himself has put in authority over us, and as we are seeking to live under the lordship of Christ, there is at times going to be a tension and there are going to be times if we want to live lives that glorify God, if we are seeking to live lives that please Him, there are going to be times when we suffer under authority for the Lord's sake, for the very sake of doing what pleases Him. So this morning we're going to be thinking about suffering we have three exhortations. Expect much suffering, trust God in suffering, and follow Christ in 
suffering. Please would you stand with me as we read from chapter 2, verse 18. Chapter 2, verse 18 of 1 Peter. This is the Word of God. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his lips. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for we were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Praise the Lord. As we stand, let's pray. Our great, gracious God, how we see your grace in these verses. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we are gathered here this morning because of your grace. And we ask that you would continue showing us grace and mercy. Would you please minister to us through your word for your name's sake and for our good, we ask. Amen. Please have a seat. So our first point, first exhortation from this passage, expect much suffering. Expect much suffering. You need to expect to suffer, friends. Look with me at verse 18. Servants, verse 18, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Servants, the word there is not the word that we understand, a deacon, those who serve at the table especially, nor is it the word that we, many of us know, doulos, which means slave. This rather is a house servant. The word is specifically the word for a house servant. Those who were treated oftentimes like part of the family. They might take responsibility to manage the family farm. Or they might even be given the responsibility as a doctor to care for the health of the family. But it, it means, I guess we would translate it as a domestic. Somebody who works most of the time in the house and is likely to be a slave. Some of these servants, these house slaves would have good and gentle masters, those who were respectful, not over-demanding, gave praise where praise is due, honored their house slaves. But others were unjust and cruel and harsh. And that word unjust actually is best translated crooked. It's from this word that we get scoliosis, when somebody has a crooked spine. They were 
perverse. They were not acting justly. And depending on what kind of master you had, determined whether you had an easy life or whether you might suffer under them. Now, at the time of this letter, Jews believed that if you suffered, it was a sign of the fact that you were unrighteous, that you were not living lives that pleased God. Do you remember how Jesus' disciples, when they met a man who was lame, they asked the question, who sinned? He's lame? He's suffering because of his lameness? Whose sin was it? Was it his sin or his parents' sin? And of course the Lord Jesus says, no, this was for the glory of God. And people today think the same, that suffering comes from not living a life that pleases God. In fact, many people today teach from pulpits that if we only do what is right, and often this doing right has something to do with giving to the pastor, <laughs> that if we do right, we'll be blessed and we'll have a carefree, prosperous life. But that's treating the Lord like a slot machine, like a vending machine. Put your 20 rand in and you get out a can of Coke. That's not right. There is blessing in obedience. But the Lord also brings suffering. And in particular, in this passage, we see, see that suffering comes because of doing good. Do you see that? Verse 19, for this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. While walking in the light, seeking to humbly submit to their master. Seeking to please the Lord, yet suffering unjustly. Having to endure sorrows, having to endure painful suffering. Verse 20, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? When this happens, on the other hand, if when you do good and you suffer for it, you endure, this is a, a good thing, when this happens, this is to be expected. This does happen. Imagine a household slave being honest and doing what is right and getting a beating for it. This should not surprise us. Think about Joseph. Joseph, remember, he was Potiphar's slave and he managed the household. He was a trusted servant. And yet it was because he did what was right that he suffered. When Potiphar's wife tried to lure him and have intimacy with him, he fled. He did the right thing. And what was the consequence? He ended up in prison. Potiphar's wife, no doubt, was shamed by the integrity and the righteousness of this young man who didn't want to walk in sin. But he ended up in prison. And it's repeated throughout the Bible where people are doing good and yet they suffer. Think of King David, not serving under a master, but he was an upright man of integrity, wasn't he? And he knew that he was going to become king someday, but he still honored Saul as king. And what reward did he get for it? He was a fugitive. He was hunted by Saul who wanted to kill him. Stephen in the New Testament was stoned to death. Why? because he preached faithfully and he was stoned for it. We should expect this. I still remember when in my youth I was working in an engineering firm and I sought to live a godly life in Christ Jesus and some of the injustices were cruel. I remember one day a guy in the workshop writing a message about the Lord Jesus with a graphic, horrible picture, and they put it on my desk. Why would somebody do that? 
my boss on one occasion at that same engineering firm told me I had to do something and I respectfully said to him, I'm sorry I can't do that because it's against the law. It's, it's not right. And he came very close to giving me a written warning. I was condemning him. I was judging him because I wouldn't do what he always did. We should expect this. Verse 21 makes it crystal clear that this is what we should expect. Verse 21, speaking about suffering unjustly when we're doing good. Verse 21, for to this you have been called. This is your calling if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is your lot. This is what you should expect. Suffering for living a godly life. Remember how the Apostle Paul told the Philippian believers, it's been granted to you, it's been gifted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. As night follows day, suffering follows in a fallen world, in a world filled with people who hate the Lord, who have exchanged the truth of God for a lie and are living for this world. As night follows day, we will suffer for doing good. Isn't this what the Lord Jesus told his disciples to expect? Listen to what he told them. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, but of course remember we have been brought, transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son, whom he loves. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. Later on in 1 Peter, Peter talks about the fact that we suffer most when we are saved out of this world, we suffer most from the people that we used to rub shoulders with. Think yourselves better than me. You're judging me by your behavior. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So you're conscientious in your work. You arrive on time and you leave on time. You'll be hated by those who are lazy because you stand out like a healthy thumb. You don't lie in order to get a contract. You don't accept bribes. Others will hate you for your integrity. Maybe even your boss will hate you. You'll fail to get any sort of career advancement. You may even lose your job because you're doing what is right. You don't cut corners. You work as unto the Lord. as an act of worship to the Lord. Others will hate you for it. This is what you should expect. Expect much suffering. Suffering for doing good. When a person is called out of darkness into his marvelous light, that person becomes an enemy of the world. And such a person becomes a target for cruel and unjust attacks because they're living for Christ and not living for the world. So if you're a believer, if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, expect much suffering. Secondly, Second point, second lesson, second exhortation. Trust God in suffering. Trust God in suffering. Your suffering is never random. The Lord is sovereign, isn't he? Over all things, which includes all of your suffering, that job loss, the Lord knows about it, and he intended it. Aren't we told in Ephesians that he's working out all things according to the counsel of his will in his perfect, infinite wisdom? 
He who knows what is best in every situation. He who is large and in charge is working out his purposes. So suffering is by God's design. As distasteful as that may sound, as uncomfortable as it may be, as painful as it might, might be, suffering is God's design. And he uses suffering to bring about good. Scripture, God's word tells us, it's familiar to many of us, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. In suffering, God is working good. Now we know, don't we, that all suffering is a result of sin. It might be somebody else's sin treating you unjustly. It might be your own sin. And even just in that way, suffering is good. It's like a, a car light that on the dashboard blinks. We've just got another car and we drove through the Kruger and we don't wear our seat belts on the Kruger because we're inching along and this light like beep, 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 and you just want to bash it. You just want to stop it flashing. But actually it's doing good. It's telling you, you haven't got your seat belt on. You need to wear your seat belt. It's good to wear your seat belt. As irritating as it might be. Suffering gets our attention. Suffering makes us prayerful. We're busy and we, we neglect to pray. The Lord brings us suffering. And we find ourselves more prayerful than ever before. We find ourselves on our knees more than ever before, which is a very good place to be. Suffering makes us more reliant upon the Lord. Rather than trusting ourselves, we trust him. We trust his lavish grace, his sufficient grace. If you want to turn with me to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, hear what the Apostle Paul says about his sufferings. Again, this word sufferings is repeated several times in this passage, as well as the word comfort. God comforts, gives grace to those who suffer for his name's sake. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Two Corinthians chapter one and verse eight. Verse eight, chapter one. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength. Remember, this was persecution for faithfully preaching the gospel, for faithfully preaching Christ as the way of salvation. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And Paul himself might even have been raised from the dead. Remember when he was left for dead after being beaten on one occasion. But the sufferings drove him and his co-workers to rely on the Lord all the more. Suffering makes us grow in godliness, in character. Remember how in the book of Romans we read, not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Isn't it true that it's at the times when we're suffering most, and in particular when we're suffering, as we try to, to honor the Lord, we're suffering for doing good, that it makes us all the more mindful of heaven. We fix our eyes on what is invisible, we know that this, this momentary and, and fleeting trial, 
is producing for us a glory that, that far surpasses anything that we know in this life. We're looking forward to seeing Christ, to being glorified. The good that comes from suffering by the Lord's design is, of course, most clearly seen in the suffering of Christ. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and from verse 21. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you. He did it for his people, for his elect, for those that have been given to him by his Father. Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Just a model of beautiful holiness, perfection, without sin in every way. <laughs> Man, yes. He emptied himself and became a slave. He took the form of a servant. He became flesh and blood. <coughs> Yet without sin. He continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Why, oh why? He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. I trust next week, God willing, we'll look at this more in depth. But suffice to say, through his suffering, <laughs> He was accomplishing the redemption of his people. He wasn't suffering for his own sin. He was suffering because of the sins of his people. Christ suffered for you. If you know and love the Lord Jesus, if you've been born again and you've, you've been called and you find yourself hating sin and trusting Christ for your salvation, if you're in Christ, know that he suffered for you. And we understand, don't we, that his suffering was not simply a beating, like a servant suffering at the hands of his crooked master who might get a beating. The worst of it was the fact that he was crushed and bruised by the Father. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that in the darkness the full weight of God's wrath was poured out on Christ, the righteous one. Christ suffered he suffered in silence. He didn't grumble. He didn't complain. He knew that what was happening was just. But it was so that God might justify those who have faith in Christ. That they might be redeemed. That we might be reconciled to God. We read later on in Peter that Christ suffered the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God, that we might have peace with God. Do you see the good that has come out of Christ's suffering? And never was an innocent person having to suffer apart from Christ. If you and I got we deserved, we would spend eternity in hell. 
but he suffered for you, believer. Unimaginable suffering. We understand that because of God's holy hatred of sin, because of his justice, because he cannot blink at rebellion, at sin, at lawlessness, he punishes sin. He will not leave the guilty unpunished. And so Christ was crushed in the place of his people. We see that. But understand that if you are not a believer and if you don't turn to Christ, if you don't lay hold of Christ, then you have this coming to you. Only Christ could be our willing substitute. The, the spotless lamb, the eternal son of God who was able to absorb the wrath of God in a few hours. If you are not in Christ, you will suffer God's wrath for all eternity. You will never repent. There will never be an end of your suffering. And I don't tell you that to gloat. But because you need to repent, you need to come to Christ. We're all in the same boat, we're all sinners. The difference is some are forgiven, some have been redeemed, and some, because of their stubborn rebellion, are unforgiven and stand to be judged under God's wrath forever. So if you know the gospel, if you've heard the gospel and you understand that you're a sinner, that you have rebelled against God. You don't love him as you ought. You don't love others as you ought. You realize that you're a murderer at heart because you fail to love others. Your sins are piling up. You're helpless and hopeless before God. But if you believe that Christ came into the world to save sinners, to give himself in the place of his people, why won't you come to Christ? What is stopping you? I'm speaking as an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm urging you to be reconciled to God, to come to Christ and to trust in him. Don't trust in your good works. Don't trust in your baptism as an infant. Don't trust in your parents being Christians. Don't trust in the fact that you're here this morning. Don't trust in the fact that you prayed a prayer someday. Trust in Christ. He suffered so that those who lay hold of him in faith turning from their rebellion, turning from their self-reliance, coming to him and laying hold on him. It's those who are forgiven, who have peace with God, who are redeemed. Even today, I urge you, come to Christ. There's no good in you delaying. There's no reason for you to delay. Come to Christ. Everyone the Father gives to me will come to me and I will never turn away anyone who comes to me. Jesus said, hallelujah. Trust God in suffering, knowing that good comes out of suffering. A and the matchless example we have is the Lord Jesus Christ. He suffered for you, believer, that you might be redeemed, that you might be reconciled to God, that you might have life in Christ. He was cursed for you and for your redemption. The onlookers didn't understand, did they? Imagine being someone outside Jerusalem. Crucifixions were a regular part of life. The Romans crucified thousands upon thousands of criminals. They were always crucified publicly 
And normally it was a slow, agonizing death. And it was a deterrent against lawlessness, such that people would obey the, the authority of Rome. But for Christ to be crucified? Christ's disciples, just think of what was going through their mind. Why is he suffering? The one who had compassion and pity on the lost, on the poor, on the sick. The one who spoke only truth. The one who was a model of integrity and honesty and goodness. Why was this happening? Why was this bruised, naked body nailed to a cross? But Christ suffered to redeem his bride. To atone for her guilt and shame. He bore our sins in his body on the tree to the praise of God's glorious grace. Good comes from suffering by God's design. And friends, not only does good come from suffering, and we need to trust God in our suffering, that he is working out good, but also there is even good in our suffering. Let's get back to, to thinking about how suffering, doing good, is pleasing to the Lord. Verse 20. Verse 20 of 1 Peter 2. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? Clearly, if a, a servant was beaten because he stole something from his master or he lied to his master and he endures it, well, that's not pleasing to the Lord. He suffered because of his wickedness. He got what he deserved. And so his enduring of that beating doesn't bring glory to God, doesn't please the Lord at all. Suppose you are lazy at work. You turn up late. You skip off work early. You don't do what you're told by your boss. If you lose your job, there's no glory for God in that. You get what you deserve. Even if you fail to grumble when you lose your job, actually you got what was coming to you. That's justice. But if you do good and you suffer and you endure, Verse 20, if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. This finds favor in the eyes of God. Why? Because even though it was painful, you endured the suffering. You kept going in doing what was right. For the sake of comfort, for the sake of an easy life, you didn't stop doing what was right and pleasing to the Lord. So a slave gets beaten for telling the truth because it puts his master in a difficult situation. He doesn't compromise even though he knows he's getting a beating. But he tells the truth. It's his master's fault that he doesn't tell the truth. As for him, he will do what is right and he'll endure a beating for it. I think of a teacher in Grace Community Church she was a school teacher, very young children. And they made it law, in effect, in that school that they had to read certain books to the children that encouraged not only same-sex marriage and intimacy, but even transgenderism. And she said, I'm not doing this. And she lost her job. She suffered for it but she glorified God. Because what she was saying was, God is worth it. My job isn't the be all and end all of life. I might lose my apartment because I can't pay the rent. I might lose my car. I might even end up homeless because nobody will give me a teaching job, but he is worth it. And I'm going to carry on doing what pleases and honors him. <laughs> 
I'll submit as far as I can, but ultimately I submit to the Lord and I seek to please him. And if because of that I get a beating, I suffer for it, well, I'll endure that. We're called to trust God at times like that, knowing that God is working good in it. It is extraordinary, isn't it, that reading of martyrs, those who have paid the ultimate price, who've lost their life because they want to honor the Lord. And we read of their savage, cruel martyrdom, and it encourages us, and it gives glory to God because it shows that he is worth it. It's common in our day to seek comfort and ease at all costs, but this isn't why we've been saved, for an easy life here and now. When we suffer for doing good, we must endure it. We must remain under it and trust the Lord that he will bring good in it and through it. Thirdly, third point, follow Christ in suffering. Follow Christ in suffering. And as I say, we're going to look, God willing, more at this next week. But look with me at verse 21. For to this, you, those who have been chosen by God, born again, redeemed at such great cost, you believer, for to this you have been called, that is to say, suffering for doing good. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. So the servant, the house slave, is being beaten for doing what is good. How is he to behave? Like Jesus. You're in a situation where you suffer under authority for doing what is good and right and pleasing to the Lord. How do you behave in such circumstances? like Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ is beautiful in his holiness. In his earthly life, in every way, without sin, he always did what pleased the Father. He was obedient even to the point of death on a cross, being accursed for us. As he was crucified, Verse 22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. It's true, isn't it, that, that when we suffer, when we are pressed, when circumstances are really hard, that's when people see what's in our heart. It's like getting a glass of, of something, and, and when we shake it, whatever's in the glass comes out and we're under pressure, we're suffering. What comes out of our mouths? Do we feel that it's unfair and unjust and so God shouldn't be doing this? Are we thinking of revenge? What we'll do to this person who is treating us so unjustly? Well, if ever there was someone treated justly by God, unjustly by the people, who crucified him, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet he committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. Are you the Christ? You said it. Could have tried to escape, couldn't he? Do you think he was tempted to avoid the cross? I'm sure. In the flesh he was tempted. but there was no deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, ha, ah, if you're the Christ, why don't you get off the cross? You saved others, why don't you save yourself? Did he revile in return? Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. 
When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. So what did he do? He continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. We understand when people treat us unjustly that it's not our job to fix things. We might repeat, report someone to the police. There might be consequences for someone's sin. But we understand that vengeance belongs to the Lord. And that person is either going to suffer eternally at the hands of God for their sin, or if they come to Christ in repentance and faith, Christ himself has borne their sin in his body on that tree. But Christ did not threaten, did not revile, he entrusted himself to his Father for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, scorning the shame. He thought, what I'm enduring is nothing compared to the fact that I'm ransoming a people who will be called my brothers and we will gather together in praise and worship of the triune God. Just think of the glory that was to come. And so he entrusted himself to his father. And so he endured, and we must follow his example. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Do we need God's grace? Absolutely. It's sometimes the hardest thing to endure, isn't it, when it is suffering unjustly, when we're doing what is right. That's often the hardest pill to swallow. But we need to follow Christ's Example, who humbly submitted himself to his Father. In your hands I commit my spirit. When you're treated unjustly, whether it's by a boss, whether it's by an ungodly husband, wives, we're going to come to that shortly, whether it's by the state, we looked at that last week, you are called to do the next right thing. And if that means enduring suffering, then you endure suffering, trusting the Lord. That he could take you out of that situation if he wanted to, but he's chosen not to. He's chosen to bring suffering into your life. Lord, how do I honor you and please you in this situation? It's what we should be asking. And in the midst of it, we submit to those who are in authority over us for the Lord's sake with all respect wholeheartedly as unto the Lord that's going to be a testimony in itself isn't it how many people in your place of work do that it means submitting to the boss as if you're serving Christ without protest without striking without grumbling this is what John MacArthur wrote on this verse. It's ultimately far more important to God that believers demonstrate their submission to his sovereignty in every area of life than that they protest against problems in their workplace. We show that we're trusting God. This is where he's put us at this time. So we trust him. We live in an age, don't we, where rights, our rights are absolutely everything. Give me my rights or I die. That's <laughs> what people think. And this world encourages people to stand up for their rights. But this is not the behavior of a Christian. We give up our so-called rights for the sake of others, for the sake of peace with our brothers and sisters in Christ, for the sake of the weaker brother, for the sake of Christ himself. We are prepared to 
give up our rights and suffer even as Christ, the one who is worthy of all glory and honor and obedience and praise. Think of what he gave up for us. We, when we do that, we are showing that our rights, our comfort, our riches matter much to us as pleasing him and giving him glory and honor. We prove at such times when we endure suffering unjustly, we prove that our real hope is in the world to come. We're not working to try and make this a perfect world. We know it never will be till Christ comes. We demonstrate that our confidence is not in my ability to fix things, but my confidence is in the Lord. I'm trusting him. I'm trusting in him who is with me in the suffering. I'm trusting in Christ who knows what it is to suffer and has promised that one day I will share in his glory. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are called to patiently and humbly endure suffering unjustly to the praise of God's glorious grace for doing good. Let me finish with words from Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you that though we are wicked sinners, not yet glorified, yet we have a great Savior in the Lord Jesus Christ who is coming again. Grant us, please, so by your grace to live in light of the fact that he is coming to reward his faithful people. Thank you, Father. In Christ's name we ask. Amen.